Good day, and welcome to my virtual lecture at the virtual BSD CAN conference. Today, I'm going to be talking about an overview of scheduling in the FreeBSD kernel. So we're going to look at the scheduler in the FreeBSD kernel. We're going to dive down into how it works, and in particular, some of the more recent changes that have been made uh, in order to work with the ever larger number of core systems on which we're running. Scheduling is how we decide when and where and for how long to run all the threads that are in the system. There's a bunch of threads that are in the operating system. There's threads that are in the applications that are running. A particular process may have a single thread uh, or it may have a whole set of threads that are running within it. So when it comes to scheduling, we are looking at all of the threads that I've just described. These threads get really divided into five different classes. We have the iThread, which is all the things running in the bottom half of the kernel. And for the most part, those are all the interrupts that are coming in, all the asynchronous activities. So disk interrupts, network interrupts, timer interrupts, anything that is delivering interrupts and requires a thread to run in order to process those interrupts. We have the current threads, which are all of the threads that are running in the top half of the kernel. And the top half of the kernel is all the synchronous things that the kernel is doing. For the most part, it is being driven by system calls that are coming in from the applications. So you do a read or a write or an open or a close. That system call comes into the kernel and uh, while it's running in the top half of the kernel, it will get one of these kern level priorities. And those tend to be higher than the priorities of processes that are running in user space because we want to get them through the kernel and out of the kernel so they're not holding locks that can potentially compete with other threads that are trying to get access to the data structures that they're looking at. Between these two, we have the real-time uh, priorities. And the real-time priorities are for user processes that are real-time processes. And on the next slide, we're going to look, dig in a little deeper on how these priorities get set. User processes, for the most part, run in this timeshare range. And this is the area, the set of priorities that we mostly focus on when we're talking about schedulers, because it's the set of priorities that the kernel is devising for each of the processes that's running uh, in the system. And then finally, at the very lowest set of priorities here, we have this, what are called the idle priorities. Uh, and these are priorities that are for very much background tasks. They'd be like a screensaver uh, or you know, some other sort of activity that will not run if there's anything else uh, that wants to go on within the system. So you can see the numeric priorities here run from 0 to 255. Higher values of priority imply lower levels of service. That is to say, 0 is the highest priority, and 255 is the lowest priority. The iThread and kern classes are managed by the kernel. The real-time priorities and the idle priorities are managed by user processes. And uh, so the user processes just set them. Uh, the kernel will then just work with whatever th they're set to. And then finally, we have the timeshare class. And this is the, uh, the management of the, the priorities that are shared between the kernel and user processes. So user processes can influence these, for example, you can raise or lower your nice value, which will bias the, them up or down, but the kernel is actually selecting what that base level priority ought to be. Let's look at each of these different types of priorities in turn. Um, for the kernel priorities, the kernel is pretty much in charge of those. The system administrator can actually fiddle with some of those priorities if they want to. So typically, the interrupt threads are the highest priority is given to things that need the lowest latency uh, and also that have high frequency. So things like network packets uh, tend to get a high priority, whereas things like terminals, if you have a serial line coming in, that tends to get a low priority. 
But for example, in the old days, we used to use serial lines to actually do networking. We had a thing called serial line IP. Uh, and in that case, it was characters were coming in much faster than a user would typically type them. And so it was important that that artificially be given a higher priority uh, so that it, you wouldn't lose the characters. OK, but for the most part, the kernel priorities, we don't make any changes to. So that really gives us three sets of areas that we can work with. The first of these is real time. And here, the processes are setting the specific priority, and the kernel doesn't second guess them. It doesn't like raise or lower them or change them. It just runs with that. And the effect of, of this is that if you set a, uh, a real-time priority and that process then goes into an infinite loop and never gives up the CPU, then the system will effectively look like it's locked up. Because the only thing that the kernel will be able to do is the interrupt threads. Uh, but none of the top half of the kernel will ever run. None of the user level will ever run. So if you have a shell and you're trying to fix something, you're, you're out of luck. So you have to be very careful if you're doing real-time priorities that you don't let yourself get into an infinite loop, that you do give up the, the processor periodically so that other things can happen. The next two here are the schedulers that are available. Uh, the, the primary scheduler that we use today is the interactive scheduler, uh, the so-called ULE. And then we still have the traditional scheduler, the so-called 4BSD scheduler. Uh, the 4BSD scheduler was actually written in 1978 uh, by Bill Joy and myself as a stopgap measure until we had time to do something right. Uh, and it actually lasted uh, well into the, the OOs. Uh, in, ULE first came in FreeBSD uh, uh, version 5 uh, and it was originally uh, supposed to be the scheduler that would be the default scheduler, but due to various problems that it had, it wasn't really until FreeBSD 8 uh, that it could be made the, uh, full -time, the, the default scheduler for the system. And 4BSD is still there. Uh, it's, a, it's a very simple uh, Scheduler doesn't have a lot of the, as you'll see, the abilities that ULE has, uh, but the, it's still useful for certain embedded applications where you just have a small processor, a small number of processes running, and you don't need all of the bells and whistles of ULE. You just need something simple and fast. Uh, so this is still there. I'm going to not really talk much about it in this lecture. Uh, I'm going to focus on ULE because that is a default scheduler, and it's the one that has uh, the capabilities that we need on modern multi-core systems. So ULE, as we will see, uh, deals with things like processor affinity, and uh, it actively calculates uh, an interactivity score so that it can figure out which processes are batch, sort of long-running computing processes, and which ones users are interacting with so that it can give better priority uh, to those interactive processes, better response time. Uh, finally, the idle scheduler, much like the real-time scheduler, the, the priorities are simply set by the system administrator. The kernel doesn't mess around with them. It simply follows them. And, uh, but unlike real-time, if one of these goes into an infinite loop, it's not a problem because if there's anything else in the system that wants to run, they will preempt it. And so uh, the, the idle priorities uh, really are not going to get you into any trouble. Now, before we start diving down into the details of this, I want to talk about how scheduling is really divided into two different parts. There's what I call the low-level scheduler and the high-level scheduler. And the low-level scheduler is the, the scheduling that runs when we do a context switch. And on a modern processor uh, that's busy, context switching is something that occurs tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of times a second. And so we need to have a very short time to figure out what we're going to run next. If the current process is blocked and says, I don't need to run now, do something else, 
we do not want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that next process ought to be. And so the low-level scheduler is, as we'll see, is just a set of priority queues. And the low-level scheduler just finds the highest priority thing to run and runs it. And then, the, the, as we'll see, uh, that's a very simple process. It's like find a queue that's not empty, pick the first thing off the list, run it. The higher level scheduler is the part that is figuring out where those different things should be, what their priorities ought to be. Now, of course, in the case of real time, those decisions are being made actually out in, in user application land. Uh, the, the user application is figuring out what the priorities of each of its threads ought to be, and that's presumably something that it reevaluates periodically and can change those priorities. For the ULE or for BSD, these decisions are being made inside the kernel itself. And as we will see, this is done much less frequently. So the, for example, for BSD, once a second would run through all the processes in the system and recalculate what their priorities ought to be based on what they'd been doing recently. ULE goes a step beyond that. ULE wants to never have to look at every process to make decisions about priorities. So as you'll see, it, it tracks within each process the information that it needs to be able to make decisions about whether its priority should be raised or lowered, whether it should be considered interactive or batch, uh, and uh, thus uh, figures out that priority in a way that uh, doesn't require it looking at everything all at once. And again, the idle scheduler, much like the real-time scheduler, the, the, the high-level decisions are being made in the user-level uh, application that's running where it can periodically decide if it wants to change the priorities uh, that it's setting things to. The kernel is only dealing with it at the low level, and that is where, it is, where the processes are in the queue, or the threads are in the queue, and where they ought to be uh, run. This gets us to the low-level part of the scheduling. The, the FormBSD scheduler just has a single global set of run queues organized from highest to lowest priority. Uh, it was designed in a day where we didn't have multiprocessors, so just having a single queue for all of the processes made a certain amount of sense. Even when you have a small amount of multiprocessing, you don't have too much contention for the lock to be able to go look at that queue. As you'll see in ULE, that's not, no longer true. So here it just had the set of processes, so it would just scan the list, find the highest priority, run it. ULE scheduler actually uses three sets of run queues, and there's a set of run queues for each CPU. So each core in the, in the system has its own set of run queues. So when a processor stops running one thing and wants to select another one, it doesn't look across all the queues in the system. It just looks at its own queues. So in the case of ULE, each, each CPU has three queues from which to work. And first of all, we have the real-time queue, and it has on it all of the, the kernel, both the, the top and bottom half kernel, and all of the real-time processes, and those of the, the timeshare threads uh, that are uh, classified as interactive. All right, and this is organized as a set of priorities from 0 to 171. And so this, this queue uh, is the first one that it will look at, as we'll see later. Uh, and as long as there's anything in this queue, that's what it will pick to run. When this one is empty, it will then move on to the, what's called the batch queue. And this has all of the time-shared threads that are classified as batch. And it's actually organized in a thing called a calendar queue. Uh, and I will have a slide a little later on that explains how calendar queues work. Uh, and then finally, there's an idle queue. Uh, and it, it has processes in this top idle set of priorities. So at a low level, we'll check this. If there's none there, we'll do this. If there's none there, then we will do that. And as I said, unlike the old one where we had a single global queue that we had to have a lock on in order to manipulate, here we just have the queues for each processor. So that processor doesn't have to lock the queue because its 
the only CPU that's ever going to be looking at it. The one exception to that is that we may need to move processes from one CPU to another. Uh, this is called load balancing, and we'll talk about how load balancing works uh, again in a later slide. Here's our priority-based queues, and this, this priority-based queue is the same as the old 4BSD one uh, or as the, the first and third of the ULE ones. And the priority queues are just organized as an array of queue heads, uh, linked lists. And so what we need to do is, starting at the lowest numbered one here, uh, we scan through uh, until we find one that has something on it. So initially, we find uh, that the priority 95 here has an Emacs. So we're going to take that Emacs. Uh, what we do is we take it off this list, we run it, and then if it goes to sleep, it's just gone until at such time as it wakes up. If it uses up its time slice, then it will come back here and get put at the end of the Q95, which in this case would be the only thing there. So it would just essentially run until it went to sleep. There would then be nothing here, dot, 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 up until we get to 120. And now we're going to have rogue. And if it uses up its time slice, it'll go to the end. And so we would then run VI and rogue and VI and rogue and VI and rogue and VI until such time as both of them were sleeping. And then we'd get down here and start running XV and Firefox and so on and so forth. And uh, if all of these were then sleeping, so there was nothing on this queue, then we would move on uh, and go to the batch queue in the case of ULE. Now, we do not want to have to scan through 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 queues in order to find which one has something on it. I mean, if you think about cache lines, there's a whole lot of cache lines we would have to hit to search through uh, since each one of these is uh, at least eight bytes. So in order to speed finding where there's an, a non-empty queue, we actually have a, a bit array here, which is called the status array. And there's a, it, the bit is set if there's something in that queue, and it's zero if there is nothing in that queue. So here we can just pick up this single word or two words, scan through to find the first bit that's set, and that gives us then the index where we are going to find a queue that has something in it. So we can pick up this and then go directly to the queue that we need, pull the first thing off the queue, and run it. For ULE, then, when we get to the batch level thing, we are going to switch from the interactive, uh, pure priority-based to something called a calendar-based queue. And the idea of a calendar queue is to be fairer than we are with the, the priority queues. With the priority queues, a high-priority thing, it can essentially starve anything at a lower priority from ever getting to run. Now, if we've done our work right, we aren't going to have anything on those higher priority queues that's going to run for very long. If it's interactive, it's supposed to do a little bit and then go to sleep. So if it starts misbehaving in the sense of using a lot of cycles, then what we will do is change it to being batch. And then it will end up down here with the other batch processes. Uh, now, if it then goes back to behaving itself, then perhaps it will get to uh, move back to the interactive queue. All right, so the idea of the, of the calendar queue is we want to try and be fair and let everything run at least a bit. Now, things that have higher priority should get to run more than things that are at a lower priority, but we don't ever want to get to the point where something that's, at a, that's just running continuously at a higher priority just blocks all the lower things from going on. So a calendar queue works as a circular queue. And so we have uh, the, the, the size of the queue here is NQ, the number of entries in the queue. And we have this pointer run queue here, which points to the current entry of which we are operating. And what's going to happen is that we are going to, once we get to run queue here, we are going to run everything that's on the list. So in this case, there's only one thing. It's the C compiler. It is going to run, and it might go to sleep, but it'll probably just run until we decide that it's not supposed to run anymore. It's used up its time slice. And at that point, we are going to uh, put it back onto the calendar queue. 
And where we put it back on the calendar queue is a function of its priority. So we have this ints queue, and this is the point where we're inserting, and it, it's going to keep moving along as well in the way I'll describe in a moment. But what we're going to do is when we've used up the time slice for a particular piece, we are going to insert it at the location of ints queue, but we are going to then add in its priority. Uh, so this, the, the, the base priority here is whatever the, low, the, the, the 171 or whatever the bottom priority is. So if it's running at sort of the maximum batch priority, then this priority minus that would be zero, uh, and it would simply go in right here. But it's, let's suppose it's, its priority is 10 above that highest priority. And so then what would happen is it would be ints queue plus 10, mod, of course, the size of the queue. So it's going to come much further down in this list. And that means a bunch of other things are going to get to run before it gets to run again. And then it's going to get put pretty far through the list and a bunch of other things get to run and so on. So things that have a higher batch priority will get to run sort of each time slot as it comes along. And things with lower priority will only get to run every third time or every eighth time or every twelfth time. But everything's going to get some amount of opportunity. At least once around, each time around the queue here, it's going to get to run. OK. Now, in some cases, we're going to get down here where we've got you know, multiple things on the list. And so this one will run, and then it'll get stuck ahead somewhere. And then this one will run, and it'll get stuck ahead somewhere, uh, as we described uh, up here above. And this you know, list might be at a higher priority, so it might just go one or two ahead of uh, where it came off, whereas TROF might be at a lower priority, so it gets stuck way up here somewhere. OK, so ints queue. What we do is that we increment it every 10 milliseconds. So it's just sort of plodding along every 10 milliseconds. So if we get stuck with a whole bunch of things to do, then ints queue may actually streak out ahead of us. And the net effect of that is to sort of push the lower priority things even further uh, into the future. Uh, generally speaking, though, if run queue gets, you know, it use, it's done everything here, this queue becomes empty, then it's going to increment up to the next queue. And after you've incremented run queue, if, it's, if ints queue is equal to run queue, then we also increment ints queue. So ints queue will always be at least one ahead of run queue. Uh, and it may be more. In, in most cases, it actually just walks along just one slot ahead of run queue. But uh, if, if the system gets particularly busy, then uh, it may get further up ahead of run queue. And the idea there, again, is to just push things uh, further out into the future. Just summarizing what I said for ULE about the run priority, uh, if that set of priority queues, which includes the real-time threads, uh, uh, any of the real-time threads, then we're going to uh, select the first thread in the highest priority non-empty queue. We saw that a couple slides ago. Uh, if this is completely empty, then any of the batch queue threads uh, run the calendar queue starting from the first thread uh, at the current entry. And the, the time slice that we use there uh, is typically on the order of uh, 5 or 10 milliseconds. Uh, but if there's a lot of entries in the queue, we will divide that, that slice by the number of entries in the queue. But we never let it get below 2 or 3 milliseconds, because otherwise we would end up just getting too much churn. Uh, and then finally, if there's no calendar queues, then if there's anything in the idle queue, uh, we will run that. And just for accounting purposes, uh, we always have an idle thread which is at the absolute highest priority, which is just there so that we don't have to have a special case in the code for what if there's not anything in any of these. Uh, so you may notice when you do a PS, you'll see uh, each CPU will have some idle that will have accumulated some huge amount of time. And that's just soaking up any time that there was nothing for that particular core to be, to, to be doing. So now let's drill down and look at the driver of this low-level scheduling. How does this actually work? Well, first of all, how do we choose to do a context switch? And uh, for the priority-based queues, we're going to run all the threads in the top queue. We give each one of them 10 milliseconds. 
uh, but we want to make sure that every thread's going to run within 50 milliseconds. So a queue that's got 10 threads will use a five millisecond time slice. Uh, we do have a lower level on that, so that if we get down to having, uh, if it would be less than five milliseconds, then we just give it five milliseconds, so that it can, it can spread out a little bit, uh, but generally speaking, we don't hit that limit. Uh, the idea is we don't want to just churn too quickly because there's a cost to doing the context switch of reloading caches and so on. Uh, for the calendar-based queues, we run all the threads in the current slot until it's empty. We give every one, a, every one of them a time slice of the same duration as we used up here. Uh, so this same business of 50 milliseconds and, or 10 milliseconds, but 50 milliseconds max for any given queue, uh, et cetera. And when a thread other than the currently running thread attains a better priority, um, then we will switch immediately. So if, for example, we're running something in uh, the calendar queue, but something comes in, an interrupt comes in on the, the, the top priority queue, then we will immediately uh, switch over to that uh, interrupt thread. Actually, it's not quite immediate, as we'll see on the next slide. But as soon as is practical, uh, we will switch over and run that. Scheduling a context switch. What, what actually causes these tens or hundreds of thousands of context switch per seconds to happen? The most common case is voluntarily going to sleep. So some process uh, does some system call that can't proceed. So for example, you, you read from uh, the keyboard and the user hasn't typed anything, so you go to sleep until the next keystroke gets typed. Uh, or you're waiting for a packet to come down the network, and so you go to sleep waiting for the next packet to arrive. Uh, or you have issued a disk I.O. and you're waiting for the data to arrive from the disk. So this is the most common case, and in this case, uh, this is called a voluntary context switch. That is, you're, you are saying, I don't need the CPU anymore, uh, run something else. Okay. Another fairly common case is when a higher priority thread becomes runnable. Uh, and this is most commonly from interrupt level. So uh, a network packet arrives, or a timer goes off, or a disk I.O. completes. And uh, this, this then causes the, the currently lower priority process to stop and the higher priority process to get to run. And then we have once per time slice. Uh, so this 10 millisecond timer that I talked about uh, going off uh, will uh, say, OK, you've used up your time slice, and now it's time for something else to get to run. Now, we said that, uh, for example, when a higher priority process comes in, we want to switch to that process. Now, often on a multi-core system, there will be an idle CPU somewhere, and so it can just be handed to the idle CPU and it can run and it doesn't need to interrupt the particular process that may have actually noticed that the interrupt happened. Because the interrupts generally uh, are, are targeted at a particular CPU or a particular set of CPUs. But assuming that we want to stop running the lower priority thread on this machine so that the interrupt can be handled, uh, for example, sometimes we will pin interrupts and say these interrupts have to run on this CPU. And so if there's a lower priority process, we want to clear it out of the way so that interrupt can, can run. We don't necessarily want to stop that other thread exactly where it is. It might be in the middle of a critical section. Uh, it certainly could be holding some longer term locks. And we don't want to put it to sleep while it's holding those locks, because that's going to just cause excess resource contention. So instead, what we do is we set a flag in its threads flag saying, I need to be rescheduled. And then that request will be processed after, uh, if, it's in an, if it's an interrupt thread, when the interrupt has returned, uh, uh, or at the end of the current system call. So if we've done a system call, as we're getting ready to return back out of the kernel, back to the user process, we notice that this reschedule flag has been set. And at that point, we know any locks that were held have been released, and at least any short-term locks. And so it is now safe to uh, context switch uh, off to this higher priority process. Now, if the rescheduling is involuntary, that is, the, the, it's 
we're not, we're not, leave, we're not switching because the, the previous process went to sleep, but we're switching because it's a, one of these cases where it's a higher priority process that wants to run. In that case, the process that we're switching away from still does want to run, so we need to put it back onto the run queue. Because remember, what happens is we take it off the run queue, we run it, and then if we go to sleep, we're done, and we just go find the next one we want to run. But if it wants to continue running, it's used up its time slice, or it's being preempted, then we need to uh, put it back onto the appropriate run queue uh, so that at some point in the future, uh, it can continue running. How do we actually context switch? Well, what we're doing is under kernel control, we're going to switch from one thread to another. And there's essentially three steps. We need to save the context of the current thread, uh, which is the registers, address space, et cetera. That's defined by the hardware, what you need to save. We are then going to choose the next thread that we want to run. And then we are going to, having chosen it, load its context. So whatever was the registers and address space needs to be reloaded here. Remember that I said this low-level context, which runs a lot. It, it's anywhere from typically one to as much as 5% of all the cycles on the machine are spent doing this. And so you really, really, really want this to be fast. Uh, now, of the three parts, the context load and save are defined by the hardware. There's nothing you can do to make that any faster. So the only place you have any room to maneuver is this picking the next thread. And that's why we want the low-level scheduler to be so simple. You know, pick a, find the bit of the queue you want, pull that thing off the queue, load it. Uh, typically, in FreeBSD, this can be done in about 20 assembly language instructions. So uh, that's why we, we split the kernel into high and, and low level schedulers so that we can make that low level scheduler very, very quick. That allows us then to take much more elaborate uh, steps in the higher level part of the scheduler because it's running much less frequently. So there, it's OK for us to spend some time really sitting down and thinking about what we want to do. The next step that I want to look at, then, is ULE. What, what is it trying to do? And this now we're talking about the high-level part of the ULE scheduler. Our goals are we want to identify and give low latency to interactive threads. Uh, this will allow that we want to allow for brief bursts of activity. In order to make this work, we have to differentiate the time where we are waiting for the CPU versus the time we are waiting for user input. If the system is really busy, you may not be running simply because you, you haven't been able to be scheduled yet. But we don't want to give you credit for, for that time waiting because you're, you're in with everything else that's trying to run. So what you get credit for is the amount of time that you're actually not wanting to run. That is, you've gone to sleep, and you haven't taken some action that says, now I want to run again. Another thing that we would like to do is, in general, to have a given thread to keep running on the same CPU over and over and over again, rather than to have it bouncing around from one to another. This is called processor affinity. And the reason is because you have state that's on a processor. You have the, the processor has caches, memory caches, and VM caches and other things. And so to the extent that we can run you fairly soon on the same CPU, a lot of the, those memory cache, the L1, L2 cache, are going to still be there. And if we move you to a different CPU, then you're going to have to get all that back into the L1, L2 cache of the other CPU that we've moved you to. So generally speaking, we want to try and keep you on the same CPU. The fact that each CPU has its own set of scheduling queues sort of naturally gives us that. Because the only way you're going to switch from one to another is at a higher level, we decide, all right, that CPU is just too busy. We're going to move you from its queue to some other CPU. When we do decide to move you, then we need to think about where we want to move you to. And uh, this is sometimes referred to as NUMA. So uh, the, you have different. Different CPUs uh, have uh, different characteristics relative to the one that you're on. So as I've said, the same CPU is sort of the ideal case. But if there's multiple cores that are on the same chip, they'll often share at least some of their caches. And so uh, if we can move you from one CPU on the chip to another CPU on a chip, 
that is not going to be as bad as, for example, moving you to another chip that's on the same board. So if it's a dual socket board and we move you from a CPU on one of the sockets to the other socket, then there's no shared uh, caching between uh, the, the CPUs themselves. There's possibly some caching on the, the memory plane that's uh, the memory that's on that particular board uh, versus have to, for example, go to the memory on a different board, but it, it's still uh, further away than something that's within the same chip. And then, of course, we may have multiple boards in a chassis, uh, and so, uh, and we may have multiple chassis, so again, staying on a CPU in our chassis is going to likely be better than going you know, somewhere else. The other goal of ULE is not to have anything where it starts with for every CPU or for every thread. We, we never have to look at every thread in order to make decisions. We occasionally do look at all or most of the CPUs. Uh, but again, that's done sort of on the order of once a second. But we amortize the fact that we do that over the fact that it doesn't happen very often. So let's start with how we differentiate interactive versus batch. So we've got a bunch of scheduling variables. The nice variable, which is the one that the user gets to set uh, in a range of minus 20 to plus 20, uh, the fault is zero. If you go up to positive nices, that means give me lower priorities. Uh, and if you go to negative, uh, that says give me higher priorities. Typically, a user is only allowed to go to higher positive values of nice, and only the administrator is allowed to go into the, the negative range. The next two variables here, uh, runtime and sleep tick, are tracking the recent CPU utilization and the recent voluntary sleep time. Uh, and so as you're running, uh, we have a statistical clock that goes off, uh, and each time a tick comes in, whatever the currently running uh, thread is on that CPU gets charged with a, a runtime tick. Uh, similarly, uh, when you're not running, you are accumulating sleep time. Now, we don't do that with a clock. We just mark what time you went to sleep and note what time you wake up, and that is the amount of time that gets put into your, your sleep tick. We then have a priority, which is the current priority that you're running at, uh, and a user priority, which is the priority when you're running at user level. Uh, normally, these two are the same value, but when you enter the top half of the kernel to do a system call, your priority may be temporarily boosted because we want to sort of urge you to get through the system call uh, and back out into user space so that we are not going to be contending as much for kernel resources. So what's going to happen is the, the way that we get these things to be recent you, CPU utilization and recent voluntary sleep time is by doing this decay. And so we decay the runtime and the sleep ticks uh, whenever their sum exceeds five seconds. So when the two of them uh, add up to uh, a total of five seconds, we essentially shave off 20% of their value. So we, we take the runtime and we shave off 20%, and we take the sleep time and we shave off 20%. So the sum of them will now uh, be four seconds. And then we recompute the priority based on these values uh, when the, the uh, thread either accumulates a tick or is being awakened. And uh, our decision on whether it is batch or interactive is if the sleep tick exceeds the runtime. So if we're sleeping more than we are running, then we're considered interactive. And if we're running more than we're sleeping, then we're considered batch. All right, so how do we decide which CPU we're going to run on? Remember, we get taken off the run queue when we go to sleep. And so now when we wake up, we need to decide where we're going to go. So we're going to follow that hierarchy pretty much that I already described to you. Um, first of all, threads can have a hard affinity. The, either the application uh, or the kernel can just say, this thread must run on this CPU. Or in the case of the user interface, you can actually say it's got to run on one of this set of CPUs. So you might say it can run on any one of the CPUs, but the, you know, only these four that are actually on this chip are, are permissible. If you have a, a, an affinity to a single CPU, then it's easy. We just put you on that queue and we're done. Um, interrupt threads that are being scheduled by the hardware interrupt handlers are scheduled on the, their current CPU, that is the one that handled the interrupt in the first place, 
but uh, if their priority is high enough to be able to run immediately. If it's not high enough to run immediately on that one because there's something at a higher priority already running, um, then we will look first at the last CPU on which that thread ran, uh, and then we just walk down that hierarchy. So we will first look for the, the one it last ran on, and otherwise an, one that's on the same chip, otherwise one that's on the same board, other than same chassis, et cetera. And uh, yeah. In the worst case, we will search the entire system for the least loaded CPU uh, running a lower priority thread. So if the, the search ends up offering a better CPU choice than the last CPU on which it ran, we will switch it. Uh, and the longer the sleep time has been, the more willing we are to switch it because the, the longer you've been sleeping, the less stuff that's going to remain in the cache. Because if other things run, of course, they're going to load the cache up with their data. So if you've run on there you know, in the last millisecond, then there, you probably have stuff that's still in the caches. After a number of milliseconds, five or 10 milliseconds, then the chances that there's much useful in the cache is pretty low. And so the effect of moving you to some other CPU to run, uh, we're not throwing away nearly as much state uh, because there probably isn't very much state left on the CPU on which you ran anyway. The last thing is that we're going to have to periodically rebalance threads between the CPUs. And when it, the CPU idles, uh, it, first of all, if it's got nothing to do, it's going to look around for other CPUs to see if there's one from which it can steal work. This can be a bad thing to do. You, you see some other CPU and you grab it. Well, if that was the only thing that CPU had to do, all you've done is pull it and it's now lost its caching and now that CPU is just going to have to find something to do. So, Generally speaking, you won't ever steal work from a CPU that only has one thing to do. Uh, you'll just leave that there. Uh, but if there are some other CPUs, then uh, we will potentially take work from that. And if a job gets added to a CPU that has excessive loads, it will look for other CPUs to which it can push work. So for example, I might have a thread that has an affinity to only run on a particular CPU. And so it goes to run, and this CPU is already full of a whole lot of stuff. It will say, look, I realize I have to run this thread, but let me just you know, shed this other one uh, off my run queue and send it off somewhere else so that I won't be so busy and I will be able to better serve this particular thread that wants to run here. And then approximately once per second, the, the ULE load balancer runs and it looks across all the CPUs and finds the busiest one, and assuming that there's more than one thing on that CPU, will take one of those and find the least busy CPU and put it there. Uh, and so uh, over time, if things get out of balance, this as sort of a backup will slowly migrate things around. And the question is, why would you wait you know, one second? Why not make it half a second or two seconds? And the answer is that if you get too frenetic about trying to move things around, you're really just stirring the pot to no great effect. On the other hand, if you wait too long, then you can get a particular CPU uh, that is very busy and it just takes a long time uh, for it to get offloaded to, to other CPUs. The upshot is that empirically what we've found is that doing this about once a second gives you the right balance between being overly uh, moving things around, uh, but also being able to uh, get things moved around wh when it makes sense to do so. so. I'm going to finish up my talk today uh, by actually looking at a very interesting paper that was done a, a couple years ago now uh, by a group at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lucerne. And uh, they, did, they wanted to compare the FreeBSD ULE scheduler uh, against the, the Linux uh, completely fair scheduler. And uh, at the time, they took the ULE scheduler from FreeBSD 11.1, uh, and they wanted to compare it with the, the Linux scheduler in uh, 4.9. Now, how are you going to do that? I mean, you can't just run between the two operating systems because there's so many other things that would affect it. But they came up with what I thought was a very interesting way of doing it, and that is they extracted ULE out of FreeBSD and replaced CFS in Linux with the ULE scheduler. 
And they could have done it, of course, either way. They could have taken the Linux scheduler and moved it over to FreeBSD and done their tests there. But uh, as they point out in the paper, the ULE scheduler is 2950 lines of code, and CFS is 17,900. And so it was just a lot easier to pull this out of uh, FreeBSD and drop it into Linux. Plus, a lot of people know Linux, and so uh, you know, it's, it's easy for them to you know, understand the, the various issues uh, that you know, are otherwise uh, due to other subsystems in Linux uh, than the scheduler. OK, so there's a number of common characteristics uh, between both of these schedulers, which made it less difficult, shall we say, to, to pull it out. Um, they have per CPU run queues, uh, both systems. They uh, context switch, the low level scheduler context switches only from the local run queue. Uh, at wake up, they select the, the CPU queue on which the process should be run. And they also both periodically uh, will steal processes when, an, when a CPU goes idle, and they also both periodically perform load balancing. So they, because they have all of these common characteristics, it was actually not all that difficult uh, to move this over. The, the paper, which I, I'll give you a reference uh, at the end of my talk, uh, actually discusses what was involved in moving it over. And it, it was surprisingly easy to do. So I've talked about the ULE scheduler. Let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of the CFS scheduler strategy. Uh, completely fair scheduler, uh, as its name implies, wants to be completely fair between all the threads. Uh, so all the threads are run round robin. Uh, there's none of this business of you know, batch and interactive. In fact, uh, in some of the tests that they did in the paper where they created enough interactive things, uh, they could completely keep the system busy and totally lock out the batch processes for you know, hundreds of seconds. In practice, that's sort of an anomaly. They had to work pretty hard to make that happen, uh, and you don't tend to get that happening uh, in most systems. Higher priority threads, uh, they're going to run uh, essentially something that looks like calendar. So they're going to go through all of the processes and get them to run. The way that they essentially stretch it out, though, is that higher priority threads get longer quantums. So if you're a low priority thread, uh, when it gets to you in the list, then you get a shorter quantum uh, than a higher priority one, which is going to get to run longer. And to try and give some boost to interactive, if you've been sleeping for a long time, then you get sort of dropped in uh, right so that you're going to run uh, soon. OK, so there, there, there is some uh, extra boost that's given to uh, things that are running interactively or running for short periods of time and sleeping a lot. OK, an additional feature that CFS has that is not present in ULE is that they collect threads into hierarchical groups, which they call C group. Uh, and the idea here is if you have uh, two processes, one of which is single-threaded and the other of which has 10 threads running in it. Uh, under ULE, all threads are treated independently of each other. And so the one with 10 times as many, thre or 10 times as many threads is going to get a lot more of the CPU. So by having these C groups, what CFS allows you to do is to say all the threads within a particular C group have to share that quantum. And so the, the single-threaded process and the 10-threaded process will get roughly equal amounts of CPU overall, which means the, the individual threads in the 10-thread one uh, are going to get much smaller quantums. And these things are hierarchical, so you can have all the threads within an application. You can then put all of the processes that are belong to a particular login session into another C group. Uh, and as I say, all the, all the threads within a C group share a quantum so that one person can't log in and then hog a whole lot of the system. They also have a, a bunch of things for dealing with NUMA, which is somewhat different uh, than the way that ULE does NUMA. So without further ado, uh, I, you know, how, did it, how did it work out? Uh, well, the, the, this is a, a, one of the figures, figure eight out of the uh, paper. And I, this, across the bottom here are a whole slew of benchmarks that they ran, which are all over the map. 
different types of benchmarks. And uh, what this graph up here is showing is there's this line that runs down the middle. And for things where there's a bar above the line, that's an instance where ULE is doing better than, than CFS. And where the, go, the line goes below is an instance where CFS is doing better than ULE. So the, the, you know, the thing to notice here is that most of them are more or less the same. They don't make much difference. Um, but uh, there are a few where there's just major differences. Uh, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine or 10 here that are up, and one, two, three that are down. So the, the number of cases where ULE significantly outpaces uh, CFS is there's a lot more of those uh, than the ones where uh, the CFS does better. Uh, but sort of the takeaways is most benchmarks run about the same. Uh, the outliers they actually explain in the paper, and they're fascinating uh, to, to read. I mean, that's, that's sort of the most interesting in, for me to see that. Um, and really, they're pretty much the same. Overall, ULE finishes benchmarks faster than CFS by about 1.5%. Uh, if we're running on a single CPU, and about two and three quarters percent uh, when we're running on a multi-core system. The takeaway for me is that Linux needs six times as many lines of code to more or less do the same thing that, that ULE can do in one-sixth the number of lines of code. The way this has happened is, uh, and you see it in a lot of the subsystems of Linux, that there's a lot of code that is looking for special cases and then targeting that. It's like, oh, I'm running the database application, and it needs this kind of scheduling, or this kind of I.O. Uh, processing, or this kind of buffering, or whatever. And so they latch onto that, and in fact, it makes that benchmark run considerably better. But what ends up happening is that sometimes it latches onto something that it thinks is one of those things, but it's not. And it turns out that that pessimizes how that application runs, because it's being mischaracterized. Uh, and that, when you read the, the details on that, you can see that that's kind of what's happening on some of these outliers here. So with that, uh, I will go on to questions, which normally I would take off the floor, except it's going to have to come in over the wire. Let me just uh, make a few comments here. Um, first of all, uh, at the bottom of the slides, you'll see references to uh, pages in the book. Uh, particularly, they are in the range of uh, 114 to 126. And that is uh, the design implementation of the FreeBSD operating system second edition. Uh, and there's a lot more detail there than obviously what I could talk about in 45 minutes. Uh, the second reference here is the paper of the comparison of the, the Battle of the Schedulers. Uh, that is in the 2018 USENIX Annual Technical Conference. Uh, if you go to the usenix.org website, they have open publication. So from the day a conference runs, all the papers are there, the abstracts are there, the slides from the talk are there, the audio from the talk is there, the questions from the audience are there. It's, it's absolutely great. Go to the 2018 Annual Technical Conference, go into the, uh, to the program, uh, pick out the Battle of the Schedulers, and it's all there to read and, and listen to. This is, if you want to contact me, my email address. Um, this is my website. On my website, I have lots of other things. There's a FreeBSD internals course, which is the whole book, a lecture per uh, chapter. For those that really like C code, I have my advanced course, which is uh, 40 hours of reading the kernel code. Then there's a set of uh, networking from the bottom up that was done by George Neville Neal. It's a series of five lectures that drills down on the internals of the networking code. I have the CSRG archive which is all the archive of everything that happened at Berkeley up until it spun off uh, the open source version, which is what, of course, became FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, Dragonfly, BSD. And finally, uh, a, a four-hour history video uh, well done with a glass of wine uh, in hand, the history of both the CSRG at Berkeley and then a view of the last 25 years of the FreeBSD project. So thank you very much, and I look forward to taking the questions that hopefully will come streaming in. <laughs> <laughs>